Hello and welcome back to another episode in our expert series of the For the Property Investor podcast. And today we have a buyer's agent by the name of Josh Descartes. G'day, Josh. Thanks Hello. for joining me. Thanks very much for having me. And um, my pleasure. And um, it's um, good to have you on. Um, Josh, you've had a bit of a um, interesting journey of um, getting to this point as being a buyer's agent. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing that journey to start off with. Um, and um, and then um, would be great to be able to uh, have a chat about uh, what what you're doing to help people uh, get into investment properties and um, and maybe share a few little uh, secrets about where you think is the right place to buy at the moment. You, I know you can't give everything away, but um, yes, we'll get into that a bit later. But yeah, please, Josh, tell us how you get started in this industry and uh, what your journey has been to to get here. Yeah, so I guess mine's a bit of a weird one, to be honest. So I always did love property. I was actually in the military for just over 10 years. Uh, oh, right. uh, while I was in the military, I studied property economics uh, and finance. So I, yeah, I uh, basically my time was taken up studying. Uh, always loved property and finance, um, but really wasn't doing anything with it at that point in time. Uh, I did the Buyers Agent Institute course when it first started, um, which was really great. Uh, learned a lot and it's, it's obviously evolved a lot since then uh, and wanted to be a buyers agent. I guess at that point in time, I really didn't think that, I think I may have lacked confidence or, or, or something of the sorts. I think, you know, I, I really wanted to be that person that had you know you compare yourself to others and you have a huge portfolio and before you start giving yeah. advice, space um credentials are one thing but experience is another so yeah i guess um yeah i sort of shelved the idea of being a buyer's agent at that point um for a few reasons um you know obviously i actually was studying family as well so i've got four kids now so i've been busy well. over the last <laughs> few years um but yeah, yeah, so, yeah that'll, from, that'll keep you busy. It's uh, so, yeah. so when did you um, leave the military? Uh, about five years ago, six years ago. So, okay, yeah. okay. But yeah, so it, um, yeah, it was a great time. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I played a lot of sport and busted my body as well. So um, yeah, it, um, it was the time was right. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to use my skills in, in property and, and I actually worked for a large buyer's agency um, as the head of client strategy. So okay. um, working in commercial and residential buyer's agency space. Uh, it was yeah. very interesting, uh, a bit of an eye opener to, to you know, what a client needs and what they want um, and, and what you need to do to execute. Um, so yeah, I worked in that space, uh, but I was actually having yeah, my, my, my son, my wife was pregnant and I was working a lot as well. So. I actually uh, stopped working there and uh, interestingly uh, wanted to give back to the family and didn't need to work. I really didn't need to work at the time. And, mm. um, but one of the things I did highlight was that uh, buyers agents all have the same problem and that's getting stock and it's quite yeah. labor intensive. Um, so yeah, I really just wanted to sort of explore that um, a little bit deeper and, and how can you solve that problem? Like what, how it's a finite amount of uh, property stock. How do you solve the problem for buyers agents? And particularly if it's a one, one person in the buyers agency, they're on the phone all day trying to get stock and you just have limited capacity. So, uh, and, and this so, is specifically for, in, for investors that you're talking about as well, isn't it? Yeah. For investment stock. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, the, uh buyers agents are all, all sort of have their areas that they like for investment um yeah. but they all are trying to fight over the same properties or trying to build that network uh so i guess I, I sort of thought well why can't we um you know build a a network of, of selling agents and and people that are selling their properties and basically give them to the buyers agents uh, that was more or less the, the crux of the idea and uh, I ended up bringing on a, a co-founder and um, yeah, we basically started only source property uh, to find properties for buyers agents and, and let them scale their business and take the pain away. Okay. Yeah. So it's and, a, a um, and um, when did you start that? 
I actually started that uh, only a year ago, just about a year ago. Yeah. So okay. uh, it was, yeah. So it was a, a really um, fast turnaround, and we're around for you know about a year, and we've actually sold that uh, now to Realty.com.au. So right. um, yeah. So it was a bit of a fast turnaround trial and error the business changed and evolved over time um you know we started very very small a few buyers agents helping them source properties and very intimate yeah. boutique sort of model and and then we changed to a, a more you know, i guess scalable model where we you know rather than trying to talk to one or two agents in an area we say let's talk to every agent in australia so we ended up with call centers and all sorts of things to try and get stock to give to, to agents and and I guess it evolved very fast and we're always changing pricing and business model and stuff. We really were just building the plane while we we're trying to fly. Um, but yeah, it was exciting. It was really cool and there was a need for it for sure. Um, and yeah, just the way things transpired, we we basically you know um, ran into our paths crossed with the right people at the right time. We needed tech and you know technical prowess and and mm. we didn't have that we had the relationship side but not the tech and we sort of tried to make those meet and here we are today i guess <laughs> and, and that exit is like very recent it's only like um... yeah yeah just like now yeah yeah so it's very 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 recent um so yeah there's about 11 fantastic well yeah, yeah. well uh, congratulations yeah, um on um on having an entrepreneurial exit and um it, it's um, and now what's next you're, you're entering the the ba space yourself as as a buyer's agent yeah so obviously it's always been something that i'm pretty passionate about uh, yeah i i don't particularly see myself just going up for a you know a large client base i really have highlighted that there's a, a space in the self-managed super fund space it is very very niche uh, and you know, having studied finance and financial planning years ago, uh, yeah, always been passionate about that. And you know, I, I really want to bring the financial planning space and the property space together. Historically, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, and just yeah, there doing, is. Mm. yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, the the financial planners have their own dealer groups, and property guys like property, and financial planners like financial planning. Um, but interestingly, there's actually a few considerations that really uh, overlap and need to be considered, I guess, insurances and, you know, life mm. insurance, TPD and all those things. They're so crucial to the puzzle and and so is the outside of property component. So um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to work with clients intimately, limited amount of clients, securing properties that are suitable for them and their needs long term and set them up for super. Okay, so from your experience and point of view, I guess it, what what's where do you where do you see the disconnect between the financial planning industry and direct property ownership, whether it's inside or outside of super? Because there there is a big disconnect. Yeah, hundred percent. So I guess um, obviously this is just my opinion from what I've seen, uh, but. Historically, financial planners, they work with dealer groups um, and they have products that they recommend and can recommend. A lot of, more, well, I'd say a majority of financial planners actually like property. It's just that it's not a really a vehicle that's in their arsenal to, to deploy, I guess. Um, and then, the, as you know, the property guys just love property. It's like a scrounge every dollar together to buy another property without care for everything else, generally speaking. Um, so I guess the disconnect is the financial planners aren't really licensed to give it like, you know, to go and buy property for people. Um, yeah. And, and then obviously the other side of the equation is property. You can't give financial advice unless you're licensed. So there's, uh, I guess, you know, two, you know, two different sort of, you know, parts to the puzzle. But I think that, you know, interestingly, they both can work you know, together and there can yeah. be some synergies there and, and there should be synergies there. Uh, it's just about creating the, the, the right um, team, I guess, that work well together. You know, um, uh, interestingly, I talk to financial advisors a lot now um, and I see that they are 
relatively on the same page with the property guys. It, it's just got to be client centric, client focus. Um, everything has to be for the greater good of the client. If property is the vehicle, then let's let's do it. If it's not yeah. the vehicle, then obviously then then that's a different conversation. But um, quite often it's a combination of the both, uh, inside or outside of SMSF. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's really just going to be what's the best interest for the client. Have we got our buffers? Have we got you know what? Are we, how are we deploying our liquid funds? Um, and have we got all our safety net of insurances? And yeah, working intimately with financial advisors is is very important. Yeah, so I've spoken to you know, a lot of financial planners and advisors myself who um, uh, do uh, definitely recommend direct property investment. And yeah. and talking to them about the the disconnect is is uh, it's really those license groups, those dealer groups that yeah. they belong to, is and the compliant the extra compliance that they have to go through as a result um, when they produce their statements of advice. Um, yeah. And so there's has do you know of anyone that's actually spoken to the head of these dealer groups and license groups to be able to work out a way to make it easier for financial planners to recommend direct property no i don't off the top of my head i don't really know anyone but that's challenge accepted i guess we can go down <laughs> yeah path. it's it, it's uh, let's see if we can try and make this change because it's 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 it they, they seem they seem to be these these mythical people in these uh white ivory towers um that we we that uh no one can talk to and um, understand what their issue with direct property is from a uh, from a compliance point of view from a liability point of view because that's what we hear from the from the people on the ground as in the financial planners themselves giving this advice so yeah, yeah it's an interesting space it's um yeah like like you said it's it'd be good to uh explore that a little bit further and what 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 is the real issue and how can we overcome that issue so that's holistic advice all around? Yes, because it, it's a definitely a growing market where uh, properties are being bought in self-managed super funds, and about it's about um, fifteen percent of the properties we manage for investors are in super. Um, yep. So we we definitely have to have a a good understanding of um, of how the super funds work and what what requirements um uh, there are to be able to um um have um the the uh, from a compliance point of view on an ongoing basis um yeah. that we need to provide so yeah it's it's uh, there's definitely a, a difference and a, a higher level of uh, service that's required but um yeah it, it's m most of the people i talk to uh they're pretty happy with uh, their investments in their super fund so yeah so moving yeah. on from there, what what are you um, doing now? So where where do you, where's the future for for you and your business, and and what are you talking to clients right now about um, um, about buying? Yeah, so I guess right now I'm obviously pretty focused on the SMSF space. Such a large growth in the space. I think if you look up Google Analytics, it's about a nine hundred percent increase year on year in the SMSF uh, property investment space. So it's quite a unique um space and yeah for me now it's concentrating on managing client expectations versus reality that's the biggest one yeah. um i guess working intimately with them and what their financial constraints are and then really sort of deconstructing what what's the risk uh, particularly if we're in super what what are the risks like employment risk and things like that more or less like a financial advisor similar approach um, what's the timeline and and is it even possible or is it fitting like fitting for your scenario? Um, so yeah, that's that's typically like what I'm doing now is really sort of trying to put the pieces together and build teams around people to execute. Um, in terms of the actual buying, uh, yeah, residential or commercial, it really depends on whether you know what's applicable to the to the client. Um, high balances um, that have accumulated and towards the end of their life cycle, uh, you know, commercial might be a better option or or residential yeah. or people's just starting out and ultimately it comes back down to the financing, right? So how much can you afford? What's your balance like? Uh, unfortunately, 
we we see a lot of people are in this position where they stop working, especially particularly women, they stop working for a few years when they have children and they end up behind the eight ball a little bit, which is unfortunate. Um, so I'd like to help them um, try and get ahead. Um, that's that's basically my mission is it's more of a passion project, to be honest. It's help people um, get the, the nuts and bolts sorted out so that um, they don't have to stress about retirement um, because unfortunately yep. Australians will probably not be where they want to be. And, yep. um, and they have to work an extra 10 years, which we can try and stop that and solve that problem. Um, you know, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, what we're all working towards and trying to help, um, help clients and, um, yeah. the whole population, I guess, is to, uh, have more in retirement and to be, uh, more self-reliant rather yeah. than having to rely on the pension or whatever the, the, the standard superannuation fund, um, helps you get to, which is really yeah. not a lot. Yeah, it's not a lot, unfortunately. Uh, if you use those calculators online, sometimes it it upsets you a little bit when you put in your details. <laughs> and you, I need to work harder. <laughs> you need to have things working harder for you. Uh, I guess is the conversation. So, absolutely. And are there any particular areas in the country that you think are the hot spots, or maybe the coming hot spots that you you can maybe divulge with us, and why? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So I guess. Uh, you know, obviously Perth is is on, on a tip of everyone's tongue. I think there's been a, a bit of a relative slowdown if you look at the data or starting to slow down a little bit. I particularly like it looking at the fundamentals from a warm spot, you know, um, like mm. a really spot point of view. Um, but again, it, it depends on the client here. So in terms yeah. of area selection, it comes down to how what their timeline is. Um, but generally speaking, I'm really, really bullish on Melbourne. Uh, despite the land tax implications, is that northern Melbourne region, uh, you know, I think directly north of Melbourne, you've got, you know, Coolaroo up to Craigie, Craigieburn sort of area. Okay. Um, particularly east of, you know, east of Melbourne as well, down towards the Mornington Peninsula, there's uh, yeah. some good spots there. Um, good rental price growth, a uh, bit of a supply squeeze. We're always looking to try and go into areas that, uh, I guess, limited supply or there's not the ability to add supply um, by you know limiting the supply and having all of the infrastructure to support there um, you know i think it's a, a good recipe for growth um, particularly if there's you know it's an affordable area um, noting that you know not everyone has millions of dollars to spend on on properties at the moment so um, yes. it's a combination of the both and i think we really need to just um identify the supply and demand metrics um, yeah. and, and work with that. But Melbourne's a good option. It's arguably cheaper than other areas in Australia now, which a few years ago was not the case. So um, the yeah, affordability... Yeah, for, for being our second largest uh, city in the country, it um, seems strange that, uh, you know, Brisbane and even, you know, parts of Adelaide and Perth are, are more expensive than, yeah. than Melbourne. Yeah, it's it's crazy to see, um, but I guess every every city has its turn, uh, as we're seeing it sort of flowing around. So, um, you know, Adelaide's still not off the table from a data point of view, and okay. uh, and uh, I guess Northern Queensland again, very very hot markets. Uh, you know, I think you run the risk of overpaying um, in some of these markets, particularly um, if you are you know fighting with other buyers agents and other other. Um, you know, consumers trying to buy product, it's it's really, really difficult to to get, you know, a, a good price. I don't particularly believe in under market value. Um, I think buying right is buying at market in a good area with the right fundamentals and, the, you know, the area and the land and the scarcity of land will do the heavy lifting for you. So, um, yes, that's and, something that's um, any, any parts in New South Wales that you're, you're finding is still performing well? And it's still a, a, a good buy. Interestingly, uh, the Newcastle region has always been a pretty consistent performer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I guess price dependent. Um, if you are price sensitive, I think Newcastle is probably not the place to, to go to. Um, however, from a consistently, you know, um, growth year on year, like it's Newcastle is actually fantastic. And I think it's um, it's underrated for sure. 
Yeah, it, it, the 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 whole that whole Newcastle Hunter region is uh, one of our favourite areas to 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 manage properties, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, because it it performs well, it, it's um, it's consistent, uh, yeah. long term, and it um, and it, it, it's it's just no sign of really slowing down because it's it's not going hasn't gone gangbusters in you know like your your Perth or your Adelaide or your your Townsvilles or um but it's it's just consistent and yeah. I, I guess uh, from that point of view it still feeds off off Sydney a bit and it's because it's close enough um but it's uh, got its stand uh, standalone benefits as well yeah I think the underrated um the most underrated metric in property is is commutability so infrastructure yeah. upgrades such as highways and things like that, it makes it very easy to to commute from Newcastle or around that region into towards Sydney, and a, and a lot of people do it. Um, they've got some very good incomes as well. as a lot a lot of affluence moving to the area. Um, yeah, don't know whether that's because Sydney's far too expensive or a lifestyle change. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great performer. Hmm. Um. Probably one last thing now is just talking on a, on a macro sort of buyer's agent industry. You know, you, you've been um, um, active in the industry for, what, a good five, six years now? and yeah. um, But you're st studying for the industry, you know, before that as well. Yeah. Um, and what um, – yeah, I've I've definitely noticed it in the in this last five six years of the difference that the number of buyers agents out there are making to different markets around the country. Yeah. Um, can you give us some insight? Um, uh, yeah, we, if you've looked at the sort of historical um, figures and 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 what difference is that this rise of the buyers agent um, now making to uh, different markets from time to time around the country? Yeah, I guess yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question because, you know, you, you could argue that um, there's obviously uh, an influx of buyers agents um, in, into, you know, into the markets. Um, and I guess with, with information readily accessible, not so much just from the buyers agent perspective, but even investors, you could add into that similar pool. It's a similar mindset. Uh, I guess the, the readily accessible information means that, you know, people are very data driven and they're looking at, you know, the very, very granular information um, when they're making a purchasing decision. There's a lot of fantastic tools now that buyers agents are using, not particularly consumers. And uh, I guess, you know, by using those, if, if multiple people are using them, whether they are consumers or buyers agents, um, you know, it, it paints a similar picture for a lot of people going to those markets, um, rightly or wrongly, I, I guess that um, you know they're in, people interpret the data um, a certain way, and, and not everyone does. Uh, I think that you know ultimately supply and demand at the moment is the driving factor, not so much the buyers agents. If I'm being honest, um, it, it's you know the readily accessible information, and the, quite frankly, the lack of building and the lack of stock in Australia, and then increased immigration is probably driving. The market yeah. more, but I guess the buyers agents have their finger on the pulse um, yeah. all the way around, and they're always looking for the next opportunity. So once that opportunity arises, obviously, you know, with an increasing amount of buyers agents, there's, there's more people in the market, um, and it probably would have a, a little bit of an effect on price growth. But ultimately, I think it comes down to supply, um, and uh, yeah, so. To answer your question, uh, I'm not really 100% sure. I have to look into the data, but um, yeah, I think it's 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 also great that people are represented now. Um, they're represented, and um, that may make a difference as well. Uh, having people, yeah, to, absolutely, um, means there might be more investor activity and and more investor activity, yeah. obviously, price growth. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's um, thank you for your insights, Josh. And no. um, it's interesting to hear your story and how you got started and um, and your journey up till now. And, um, yeah, looking forward to hear what um, inroads you can make to uh, helping bridge that gap between financial planners and property investors. Um, I think it's very much something that 
needs to be done to uh, to help the investment journey for many investors. Yeah, hundred percent. Hopefully, we can solve that problem, and uh, you can help me tackle it if you like. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, um, put me on the team. Happy to join. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Josh. And no worries. Um, if if anyone wants to reach out to you, what's the best way of finding you? Um, you on all the socials? Uh, yes, I am on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and then I have yeah, just my traditional website. But feel free to uh, just reach out via phone or email. Um, and yeah. All right. Well, well, what I'll do is if anyone wants to get in contact with you, please um, reach out to us through uh, the podcast or through um, uh, any of our socials and we'll uh, definitely put you in contact. So um, thanks again, Josh. Great to have you on. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated.